Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Exploit In-Store Data. My name is Holly Pels, and I'm with Rick Software, and will be your moderator for today's event. We have an exciting webinar ahead for you today featuring Rick Software's Jason Becker and Atrix's Matt Schwartz. Before we get started, there's a few things I need to cover. Today's webinar will be recorded and will be made available to you after the event is over. For a better viewing experience, all lines are muted. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat box in your webinar control panel. Due to time constraints, we will answer all of your questions via email following the webinar. I believe that covers all the details, so I'm going to pass it over to Jason to get us started. Jason? Perfect. Thank you, Holly. I appreciate it. Uh, Matt, if you could advance the slide, that'd be fantastic. Um, as Holly suggested, my name is Jason Becker. My role at RIC Software is CEO. Uh, just for some background, because I know we have some folks who are not currently RIC's clients on the phone. Uh, RICS makes retail technology that's used mostly by North American footwear and apparel retailers. Our clients use our product to manage their inventory, sell it to POS, uh, track customer data, and report on business performance. Uh, my role at RICS Software is to help grow the business and make sure we're running a profitable and real business. As we think about growth, it's first and foremost about keeping our clients, expanding their value, and then getting more clients. You know, one of the ways that we expand value over time is by working with companies like Atrix who are also in our market with a high number of clients that overlap ours, delivering services, delivering value by partnering closely with, with companies like Atrix. So I'm thrilled uh, that we have Matt Schwartz on the phone today, a co-founder of Atrix and a member of the leadership team there to talk more about their perspective on the market as well as how to create in-store experiences that are unique to the store format and also memorable. Uh, a couple of other high points about RICS before we get started, and I turn it over to Matt. Uh, we're in our 35th year, so we're 35 years young. As I mentioned, uh, we try to run a real business, so we're growing, we're profitable and sustainable. Uh, we've got a great team of people with a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences in retail and technology and change management. And unlike some of the folks in the marketplace that you may be familiar with, we make, test, sell, support, and consult on our product. Uh, so we build our cloud-based uh, subscription retail technology service and take that directly to the market. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Matt. Uh, I had a chance recently to see Matt and his brother Larry down at the FN Platform CEO Summit in Miami. Matt, it's good to have you on the phone today and, and great to have your perspective on the market. And I'm super pumped to see the presentation and see what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, you know, much appreciated, and we're, you know, we we very much appreciate everybody's taking the time to be on the call. We're excited about our partnership with Ricks, um, and and you know about the benefits we we believe we're going to be able to to bring everybody's businesses. Um, I thought I'd just start with a quick introduction to Atrex for for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Um, we are a a 71 year old business founded in 1946, actually by my grandfather and his brother. And the, the history of our company is really is what we like to think of the foot geeks of the business. And, and what we did for, for many, many years is innovate uh, products and, and material technologies that are related to custom and prefabricated orthotics. Uh, so our background is really understanding feet and how they impact the, the function of our bodies from the ground up. Um, the quick of, of the history is that at some point, about, let's say, around 11 years ago, we, we realized that we had amassed the kind of expertise uh, that, was, that was special and that we were bringing to bear in, in healthcare channels of distribution. So that's how our founding company, which was called Apex, uh, was understood as the premium brand for these types of products in healthcare channels. And we could apply them to consumer products and bring these kinds of benefits to the consumer as well. So this way, when it comes to, say, orthotics, instead of having to pay four or $500 for custom uh, in, a, in a regular retail environment, whether it be in the comfort shoe space or the running space, we could provide the consumer with that kind of benefit at a, at a far lower price point. And part of what facilitated this, uh, this change in our business was we would see scanning technologies at medical uh, shows that were utilized as profit centers for the businesses that sold them. And we realized we could harness that to some of our orthotic lines, particularly ones that were custom select, um, make it a loss leader for the business, business and bring it uh, you know, to bear on, on retail channels of distribution. And, and 
the, the reason I bring it up is I want you to understand that when we talk about technology, something that differentiates our business is for almost 15 years we've been in the hardware and software business. And we're going to talk a little bit about foot scanning technology. And I think it's important to point out that we manufacture foot scanning technology. And we write all the software and have been for a very long time. Our headquarters, our global headquarters, is right outside New York City in Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, but we also own a business in Israel. Um, where we, we develop and manufacture our hardware. Um, we also recently acquired a company called Souls, which is a leading developer of mobile applications for mobile scanning technologies, which currently is out of, out of New Jersey. And we have an office in southern China um, that with about a dozen or so people there uh, full-time on the, on the development side, uh, as well as, you know, of course, a development team here in our, in our office as well. Uh, other things to point out about the business that makes us a little bit different is that aside from being really vertical in the sense that we manufacture, you know, hardware, write software, uh, we have our own in-house sales and, and marketing. Um, we also, though, are not just partners with multi-brand retailers, but we're partners with, with brands as well. So we're, uh, you know, partners with, say, New Balance is a, is a licensee, Rockport, Red Wing, Wolverine Worldwide, as well as leading comfort shoe and, and athletic retailers. Um, around the country and have a, a very fast-growing global business as well. So that's the, that's the quick introduction. The agenda that we have in mind is to really spend about 10 or so minutes talking about what we see as the challenge that everybody in retail and brick and mortar, particularly multi-brand retail, faces today. I, I personally believe, and I think we've all experienced that, of course, change is accelerating year to year. And I think the last couple of years have seen some important changes in our business uh, that I thought would be highlight, uh, would, would be important to highlight so that uh, we could set a good context for explaining what we believe is the mutual benefit that RICS and, and uh, HREX integration can bring to, to your businesses. So, uh, so, you know, here we go. We're going to dive into that. Some of this stuff is, uh, may seem obvious, but again, I think important to, to make explicit. So I want to start with just a traditional understanding about the, the relationship between brands and retailers and how we, we've understood it historically. And that's that the job of the brand is to identify demand in the marketplace and set up the infrastructure to develop products that we can then sell to the retailer. And the retailer's job was to set up the infrastructure so they can bring those products to the consumer. And the, the brand, the wholesale brand, would make the margin between their first cost and the wholesale price they sell it to the retailer at. And the retailer would make the margin between the price they purchased the products at and the MSRP, the price they sold it uh, to consumers at. And while this seems super obvious, nonetheless, the business has changed in a number of fundamental ways over, over a long period of time. So first off, brands who saw that demand from the consumer population recognized that they could set up their own vertical infrastructure on the brick and mortar level to bring their products to the, to the consumer. And that's what happened. There was a, a lot of growth in mono-branded retail. And because the margin structure for the mono-branded retailer uh, was significantly enhanced as the rents went up, they became dominantly the retailers which were available to bring their goods and services to the population of people shopping at, at malls and, and very busy uh, downtown locations. And we saw that eat into the market share of the service-oriented multi-brand retailer. The next stage, of course, of, of change here in terms of market share was the advent of the Internet. And the impact this had on, on market share. And that's not just when it comes to multi-brand e-commerce, which was the first stage, but also, again, mono-branded e-commerce, uh, which we've seen and, again, took away significant market share from the multi-branded brick-and-mortar store. And, and what we've seen as that move has happened is more and more retailers, uh, multi-brand retailers, look to find either products they can bring in directly from from manufacturing countries, whether it be Portugal or Italy or China, uh, you know, a greater push toward enhanced margins, um, you know, uh, container programs, SMUs, things like this, where, of course, the retailer, the multi-brand retailer as well, uh, could, could be vertical insofar as possible, direct to the consumer. 
And the net result of this has been, or a summary has been, first we saw multi-brand stores have their customers migrate to e-commerce. And when you go to an industry conference, conference the conversation would, would be around competitors like Zappos or Amazon. But a, a big shift in the last couple of years of kind of tilting in our industry um, has been to this, this idea that we live in an increasingly direct-to-consumer economy. And the net result of it is that a lot of multi-brand retailers have come to feel increasingly in competition with the brands they're selling in their store. And when I say these things, they're meant as just descriptive facts about the world we live in. I think it's important to put the cards on the table and have the, the context as it is. So we have multi-brand retailers, brick-and-mortar retailers in competition partly with the brands they sell. We also have this true for multi-brand e-commerce sites. If you ask yourself the question, who is Amazon's biggest competitor for Nike? The answer, of course, is Nike.com. And who's their biggest competitor for, say, Clarks? It would be Clarks.com or Atrix.com, et cetera. Okay? And, and the last result of this that's worth emphasizing here is it's not just true that this is this shift to the direct to consumer e-commerce businesses eaten into the multi-brand retailers brick and mortar productivity, but it's true for the mono-branded retailers. So Clarks' biggest competitor for Clarks.com, I mean, excuse me, Clarks' biggest competitor for their own brick and mortar stores is going to, of course, be their, their own e-commerce platform. And so you see, you know, a lot of changes there, which we, I'm going to highlight in the, in the next couple of slides. But the key um, consequence is a declining productivity per square foot at brick and mortar retail. And this is really all over the business. There was an interesting article recently in the journal, maybe in the last month, um, where you know, they were talking about a historic number of, of you know, brick and mortar store closings in, the, in this past year. Um, here's a slide that shows how many stores, these department stores, how many locations would have to close, according to this, this survey, um, the study to be at the productivity per square foot they were at 10 years before in 2006. Very meaningful numbers just to get back to a decade earlier in productivity. And you know, if you compile information data about store closings at mono-branded retail too, it's uh, or multi-brand, it's it's pretty dramatic in the thousands. Um, here you can see a list, you know, Macy's and Sears, Gab, Limited, Pax and Wet Seal, etc. Um, there's another list, and of course, there's been a you know also a, a historic number of bankruptcies to reorganize. And again, this is about increasing productivity per square foot. The other thing to highlight here is a consequence of the shift in the retail and consumer behavior is the customer really coming into the center, being in, in control uh, in a way that's different than than in the past. And I think there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, I think one is that the customer has an enormous variety of options at their fingertips that are available to them everywhere at the same time. They need merely, you know, click a couple of buttons and have that store available to them where the, the inventory or merchandise uh, isn't limited by square footage of a back of house, but is the world's supply and you can click some buttons and slide some levers and drill down to your personalized preferences. And they're in a position not only to, to make decisions based on uh, fashion, whether it be color or material, but based on their own unique priorities, could be price, it could be that speed of delivery, and they might be shopping between sites just to, you know, to, to make decisions based on whatever their unique mix of preferences at that particular moment. The customer, from that perspective, is increasingly in control of the shopping experience. Uh, and it's also true that this is the customer is in control in the sense that there's a, a capacity to interact with the customer um, for a brand or whether that be a retailer or a wholesale brand directly in a way that's never existed uh, in history. And that has to do with the ability to profile who it is that is responding to and acting on you know, your, pro your products and your, your marketing campaigns and take that profile and utilize it to target consumers who are the most likely um, to you know, to, to buy into whatever your brand aspirations are. And this is something that's a, a real opportunity, an important one, uh, that again is, has placed that, that customer uh, at the center, um, you know, in terms of our lives as, as retailers. So I say all this, um, I think there are going to be losers still, but they're going to be winners. I believe it's the context is just, again, a descriptive 
fact about the world we, we live in. We have to understand it, and then we have to navigate within that and decide what are the solutions that we can bring to bear on our businesses in order to, to be one of those people who fall into the winner ca uh, category and can capitalize on what I believe in. I know all the, the peers I interact with constantly in the business believe will be an ongoing and thriving brick-and-mortar business. The questions that are really in the background here that we believe every retailer needs to have top of mind is one, how do we keep the customer coming back to the store? So question one, in this situation, decline in productivity per square foot, how do I keep that customer coming back into my store? And a question you need to ask yourself there isn't a question of who is my customer from a demographic standpoint. It's not simply about what's their economic status, their gender, their race and ethnicity. Those things are correlated with their, their going to the store, they're getting in the car and driving 20 minutes or whatever it is that they have to do to, to get what they want from your business. But you have to ask the question, what's the causal story? What are they hiring my business to do for them? What motivates them to ask, to, to act? Excuse me. So how can we keep customers coming back to the store to... How do we sell them more when they're in the store? How do we increase our productivity per square foot? And three, how do we compete for their digital attention? Because as everybody knows in their lives, everybody in business, everybody personally, we're increasingly inundated with information and data on our mobile devices, and everybody is competing for the attention of the end user. So how do we maximize our opportunities? to have the digital attention of the end user? How do we have their attention when they leave my store? So just to highlight again, how do we get them in? When they're in, how do we sell them more? And three, how do we keep people their intention when they leave? So that's the context, that's what we wanted to speak to. We believe we have a, a very unique solution that's designed to answer these three questions. We're gonna start by showing you something we call Albert. And Albert is the name of our new technology program. This is a a scanning technology has been development for a couple of years. Um, this is actually something we're launching to market just now, so you're some of the first people to see it. And we call it Albert because we believe it's the smartest scanner uh, in history. Uh, we're going to demo it for you. This is the Albert OS that you're looking at right now. It's a user interface. I just want to show you. I'm going to swipe in between that and something that we call the control panel. The control panel is a place where you can access data that's captured at Albert at the scanning technology. It's also a place where you can remotely control the user interface in your stores. If you're a multi-brand retailer and you have 50 locations where you can say, I want these experiences at these six stores and these experiences at those 10 stores, etc. So that's the control panel. I'm going to swipe back into Albert OS. This is the operating system or what the consumer sees. When they're, when they're standing on the scanner. And I'll, I'll show you, since we don't have a camera on, I'll quickly show you a picture of what the scanner, what we're talking about, what it looks like. You can see right here, that would be, say, a kiosk, but Albert, as a piece of hardware, is what's sitting right there uh, on the uh, floor of the store. So going back to Albert OS, we're doing a live scan here. Oh, I accidentally clicked male while I had a, a female on the scanner, so I'm going to go back. Hold on. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to scan Melissa's feet. She stands inside here. There actually, Albert has audio prompts. I turned them off for the purpose of this call. But an interesting thing is we designed it like Siri, where you can interact and use voice commands, Albert, start, scan, etc. cetera. Um, but what's going on with this technology is you have three layers of hardware. Underneath the, the very bottom layer, you have 5,000 gold-plated barometric sensors. So they're barometric pressure sensors that are designed to measure pressure, and there are four of them per square centimeter. So it's worth picturing that in your mind. Picture a centimeter and then divide it in four, and we really have the, the cutting edge of sensor technology at, at play here, which is going to analyze the pressure distribution under her feet as well to be brought to bear on the measurement of her, of her arch. And then above that, we have just under a 1,000 infrared LEDs. And what they're designed to do is picture it as a digital measuring device. So we could put anything in there. We could put a, a shoe in there and measure it, and it's going to measure down to one-tenth of a millimeter. So picture a millimeter in your mind, divided into 10 pieces, and that's what we're, we're measuring the foot to. And then above that, we have 18 cameras. And the cameras 
16 of them, what they do is they use something called stereoscopic vision. And what's interesting about this is they act like human eyes. So you have two fixed cameras picture looking at one point from two angles and the software using trigonometry to measure depth to triangulate between them. And we use these 16 cameras to build a three-dimensional model of the consumer's feet. And there's, there's some very interesting uh, benefits we can bring to bear, not only for the consumer, but for our businesses by capturing all this data. And something that differentiates this kind of technology from other 3D scanning technologies that exist, and there are not that many, is most of the others use something like infrared light, which they project onto the object, and they have sensors that see the, only that projection, so they can never see the object itself. So we spent years developing this because we're looking at the actual foot, and it's going to potentially enable us to measure from any given pixel to any given pixel and have an enormous amount of data that we can collect about our consumers that, as you're going to see, we can bring to bear not only on how we buy or how we develop products, but also to bear on our, our direct consumer or consumer-centric marketing initiatives. So at the end of this test, we got a result. And the result is the custom selection of a pair of orthotics for Melissa's feet. And what we find out is she has medium arches. You can see that on the left-hand side of the screen. We can see her suggested shoe size. And if you look above it, it's measuring there in millimeters. So she had a 25.90 right, on her right foot and a 25.7, which just shows you what it actually is. The suggested size for her and what she wears is a, is a size 10. And based on that information, it custom selects a pair of orthotics that are customized for her unique arches and pressure. And there are four different types of these. And what we're presenting the consumer with is the opportunity to personalize their footwear inside, to have their shoes fit inside, to help them avoid setbacks, to help them feel great on their feet, to help them lead the active and healthy life that, that they want. And from a business perspective, what's been incredibly important for our growth and for our customers' growth is that we're taking a category which is usually undeveloped in our retail partners' businesses, and we're turning it into what's often the biggest profit center in their business. So we have many, many stores around the country who will do well over 1,000 pair. We have stores that do 7,000 pair, but we have lots of stores that do 1,000 to use round numbers. And we're talking about $60 aftermarket orthotics that offer 60% margins. So using round numbers, we can look at adding about 60,000 in revenue and about 36,000 in gross profit to that store. And if you do the productivity per square foot on the program, it rivals literally the best productivity in the business. It's been a very important uh, tool for our partners to be financially healthy and to drive profit in that retail setting. But the next set of ben benefits that I want to talk about attend to data. So let's quickly look at the data that's collected. First, we have the underfoot scan using the barometric sensors. And while you can't see me, I'm running my finger along the, the pressure readings here. And you'll look at that scale on the left. And you can see the fine grain reading of pressure. It assigns a number between 0 and 256. And for each, each point of the foot, we have that amount of pressure. That's, again, 4 per square centimeter. We also see here the arch shape. She has medium arches. On the 3D scan, we see Melissa's suggested size, 25.73. Remember, down to a tenth of a millimeter. I can rotate the foot here, and we can get all different kinds of information about it. And we see with here, 10.05. That was for her left foot. We, of course, have her right foot as well. And Albert, while I again have it muted, will has, talks to the consumer and tells them what it's learning. And the long-term plan is to optimize the software to capture more and more data about the customer's feet that we're, we're going to use in ways um, that, that we're going to talk about. Of course, we have the custom selection of the orthotic that alternative to a custom orthotic. It comes in one of, of four structures, and the machine tells you which one's right for, for her feet. And we're also able to capture unique data about what's called her pronation. This is something a store can use to show how orthotics benefit the customer in terms of alignment. And if you're in the, when I say alignment, I mean alignment from the ground up, not only for her feet, but for her knees, even her back. And if you're in the athletic business, this is something that can be brought to bear on the selection of footwear in a way that's very germane to how that business works when you talk about motion control shoes or neutral shoes or supported cushioning shoes. We can look at this to see what it is we need to provide 
to the end user in terms of her footwear, in terms of the benefit of the orthotics, that personalization of the shoes, and of course, as we're going to talk about in a moment, in the um, way in which we communicate with her after she leaves the store. So something you may have noticed is that at the end of the scan, a box popped up that looks like this. At the end of every scan, or at the beginning, depending on how you want your software set up, and we set it up for you, it's all plug and play, we can say to the consumer, give me your information and we'll send you your scan. So we don't ask, we just simply say, hey, this is free information right, that we've, we've, we're going to provide to you. Plug in your email address, and she sits and she types in her email address and we'll send you the scan. Now, one thing to note is when we do this, the way we've integrated it with the RICS POS is that these fields do two things. One is they look out at RICS and they look to see what fields are already populated there about the customer. So on the RICS version of it, we have different fields. It could be their name, it could be their address, it could be their email address, and it's going to look out into your RICS database and say, hey, is Melissa a ready customer? If so, I'm going to marry that data I just captured, that unique data about the length of each foot individually, the width of each foot, the pressure of each foot, the arch type of each foot. I'm going to marry that into my profile that I've created in Rex. If it looks out and doesn't see that that information exists there, it's going to create a new customer for you within Rex. So all this data is going to be brought into the POS. Okay. Now, one thing we found statistically that's incredibly valuable is email acquisition rates increase at iStep. Why? Because who is a consumer who hasn't had the experience of walking up to the counter to make a purchase and then ask, say you're a J. Crew or Banana Republic or where you like to shop, and say, hey, can we have your email address? And you simply say no. Why do you say no? For the same reason we're talking about related to competing for your customer's digital attention is we're all inundated with so much information. So email acquisition rates often at the cash register are a bigger challenge than they are at, at Albert, at the scanner. Why is that? Because we've engaged the customer in this incredibly cutting edge, unique fitting experience. That's free. That's for them. That's personalized. That's got their feet, not anybody else's feet in it. It creates reciprocity. We've done something for you. Now at the end of it, we're simply offering them a further step of this. We're going to give them that information. So you will increase your email acquisition rates. And as presumably everybody knows on the call, the power of the email address and the digital marketing, marketing ages is just, it's so important. It's so incredibly important. So it's just a simple benefit, aside from creating this unique, personalized, differentiated service experience that's designed to capitalize on exactly why the customer is getting in their car and driving to the store in the first place, right? Aside from that, and then aside from increasing our productivity per square foot, we're capturing unique data, including email addresses. Now this data, this data is living in what we call the control panel or in your RIC software. And that data can be utilized for your marketing initiatives. So there's different ways to think about this. Let's say for the sake of argument, you come to the end of the season, and on the bell curve of sizes, you have an excess inventory of women's 5s and 11s. And let's say you're a running store, and you have a lot of it in your neutral shoes. You can take your database. In our case, it's in the customer data center, which you can see there in red. It's a red stripe right there. And in Rick would be in your software. And you can segment down to your women's 5 and 11 to a medium arches. And take that population of people and say, I'm going to give a gift to you for Mother's Day. Here is a 50% off coupon for you, for a neutral shoe in your size. And instead of having to blanket all of your email database with a coupon and drive down your profitability for your, your overall merchandise assortment, you can do it in this very, very targeted way. You can also target customers with educational content, with just general benefits about their feet. What do we know if somebody has flat feet? We know that they're prone to all different kinds of setbacks. The most common foot condition called plantar fasciitis, something called heel spurs, bunions, knee issues, back issues, sometimes neck issues. Now, you don't need to play doctor, but we can talk to people 
We can talk to people about their unique needs. And if you haven't looked into it, there's an enormous amount of data showing that consumer-centric marketing is far more effective. It can be measured that it's more effective than just generic marketing. So you can imagine all you want, all the different benefits we can bring to bear from this perspective. But remember one important thing. The data we're talking about is data that can only be captured in a brick and mortar setting. That's part of what's exciting about it. You can't do this online because you can't have a scanner online. You have to physically go into a store to be fit for these types of products and for this kind of marketing experience or communication. No retailers but you with this type of program are able to say to the customer, we have this for you when it comes to their arches, their pressure, their size, et cetera, to, to this extent. So a very, very important way to meet that challenge of how do we compete for our customers' attention when they leave the store? What we do is we talk to them about themselves. We personalize our marketing assets and our marketing initiatives in a way that's, that's focused on data that can only be captured in a brick-and-mortar setting. I'm going to jump back into the PowerPoint. This is a picture of, of Albert. There are different kiosks. This is one of them. This is a slide to show you just quickly an estimate of productivity per square foot. So in this case, we overestimated. We went with 30 square feet, and it's $2,230 per square foot if you're selling an average of three a day. That's what this chart's about. And just for, for what it's worth, to put it in context, here are your top performing productivity per square foot retailers in the world. It's Apple, the, the highest productivity per square foot of any retailer in history, Murphy's Gas Stations, Tiffany, and then we fall next, right in between there in terms of the value of that square footage. So it's a very, very powerful program. I want to take a minute. I want to pass the mic back to, uh, to Jason, um, who I know wanted to say a little bit about the interface within RICS. Sure. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate the conversation today because I think from our point of view, it absolutely hits the nail on the head in terms of talking about a way to differentiate the in-store experience to create one that is really impossible to replicate over the internet and really driving the value for the consumers who are coming into the store. Now from the Rick's vantage point, as Matt suggested, we're able to take that information captured uh, in Albert and put that right into your Rick system so that no matter where you're interacting with your customer, whether it be at the Albert kiosk or at the point of sale, you'll have access to that basic information. Your sales associates will be able to address questions about what the data from my last scan was, what type of shoe I should be in. And so that connectivity between Rix and Atrix is really powerful and we believe is something that we will continue to look for ways to enhance and make that better over time. So we couldn't be any more excited about the more closer relationship that we're building uh, with Atrix and being able to take that to market and do some really cool stuff. And Matt and team, I really appreciate your participation today. Uh, it's been fantastic. I'm sure the audience has gotten a great deal of insight and value from seeing more about what you guys are doing. And thank you guys very much. And I'm going to turn it back to Holly to wrap up here. Awesome. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Matt. Um, we do want to take another quick second to thank Matt and the rest of the Atrix team for participating in today's event. As I mentioned earlier, we will be answering all of your questions via email following this webinar, so feel free to take down our presenter's emails and send additional questions their way, or you can reply to the invitation um, to my email, and we'll get those questions answered for you. We also have recorded the webinar, so be sure to look for that in your inbox in the next couple of days. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you guys have a great day.